Okay, back on schedule um, for doing my reviews for this, uh, for One Piece. So, a um, couple of things before I really get into the video. Um, a, my old camera was not doing very well, so I had to get a new one. This one is a temporary one, and then I have a better one on order, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and so, so, I think it's a slightly wider angle lens, so I think you see a little bit more of the room, but it just looks better in general for pixels. Um, and I am feeling a lot better. I still have a bit of a stuffed up nose, but that's just seasonal allergies this time of year for the most part. So that's what I have there. Um, first off, uh, in regards to the chapter, considering uh, information that was released with the chapter, an apology, I guess, from Oda with the chapter, um, this chapter is not 100% finished, as in all of the line art is not finished, there's still weird shading, there's still sketches in certain areas, it, it's still very rough in certain areas. Um, this was stated to be because Oda just didn't, um, he couldn't get it completely finished by the time it was due, so there's a lot of people, myself a little bit, kind of a little bit, you know, worried, uh, hopefully, that, um, hoping that Oda is okay. Uh, we know the other, you know, manga and uh, manga, mangaka and stuff like that have had uh, health issues and things like that that have resulted in either hiatuses in the series or slightly lower quality work or shorter chapters or stuff like that. Um, so we'll see what ends up happening with that. I'm hoping Oda is fine and that this is just a fluke. Um, it's I when I was first reading the chapter, I did notice that it looked kind of odd because I hadn't read the tweet yet, or I wasn't informed about the tweet yet. And I was just like, well, this seems a little bit odd. Why Why does this look a little bit less clean than normal? And I thought maybe it was supposed to be a representation of, like, from Kuma's perspective of, like, you know, his world's falling apart and it's not as clear as it used to be because, you know, Ginny was captured and everything. Um, and such. And that was, like, an initial thought that I had, and I'm like, well, that would have been an interesting, arti uh, you know, artistic choice from Oda, um, but that's not the case. Um, and I just, I looked at why does the One Piece chapter look odd? It's just like, oh, that's why. Okay. Um, and if it is just he just didn't get it all finished in time, but we still get the same setup for the story and everything like that, then I'm fine with that. Um, just hoping that he ends up being, you know, okay, because um, we don't want Oda to get sick. Um, because we don't want a rushed ending that, you know, doesn't allow us to actually fully appreciate the story that Oda has been telling for the last, you know, 24 years and everything. So we'll see what happens there. Um, the other thing is that from an artistic perspective, it is kind of interesting to see a little bit of like the process that Oda goes through for drawing out the chapters. Um, that, you know, he blocks out certain things, he has certain stuff that is very big and very clear, and then he have, has other stuff that doesn't get, you know, um, you know, fully finished until a little bit later on and stuff like that. So that's just kind of an interesting process. Um, I just, I just found that interesting. I'm one of the people that likes to watch the behind the scenes things of, you know, shows and stuff like that to see how they make the shows and, you know, movies and stuff like that. So I just kind of find that a little bit interesting here in that regard. Um, so going into the actual story, I actually just noticed I don't have my light on back here. Should be pink. Well, we are talking about the birth of Bonnie, um, for chapter 1098, um, almost at chapter 1100. Um, so into the actual, um, chapter itself, the cover page is just, it's adorable. It's Brooke, um, with an electric eel powering his guitar as he does a solo, which is just kind of fun. Um, just, just a request. Um, it's, it is a cover request by Skywalker. So Luke, Leia, Luke have any kids in the extended universe? Not in the... He doesn't have any in the actual movies, movies, but in the extended universe, I do believe he has, um, you know, whatever. Um, he has children in, like, the comics and the light novels or whatever they're referred to as. Um, so. Hi, Brenda. You a happy girl? She loved when I was off because I was sick. 
Well, I don't think she liked the fact that I was sick. She liked the fact that I was off, and it meant she got extra snuggles time because it means I wasn't able to work her. No, I love Mommy. Yeah, I know you love Mommy. But mommy has to record. Talk about sad stuff, and then kind of happy stuff, and then sad stuff again, because this is one piece. So, uh, into the actual chapter, we kind of have where it left off last time, but it kind of skips ahead about two years or so. So we start off at Baltigo, and we have it that they're receiving information about, um, you know, Ginny and everything like that. At the end of the last chapter, it was revealed that Ginny got kidnapped. Um, very quickly soon, we're going to find out who kidnapped her. Um, in this case, you know, we see, um, we cut to where we have Ivankov, and Ivankov is, um, uh, you know, he's like, well, we can't, our hands are full dealing with the wounded from Goa. So 12 years ago is when everything happened with the Goa kingdom with, uh, Luffy and Ace and Sabo and with the burning of the gray terminal and everything like that. So that's when that happened 12 years ago, which we'll be going over some of that later. Um, um, and you know, we know that they're trying to request backup for the South Blue for the uprising down there, and it ends up being uh, Kuma that goes, and or Kuma's like, "I'll go," and they're just, you know, they're just like, "Don't be rash, Kuma. You've been acting reckless ever since that day." So it's he's been acting reckless ever since Ginny got captured, um, and he, you know, uses his devil fruit power, his Niku Niku power to, you know teleport himself to the kingdom that Ginny had probably been at for the uprising before she'd been kidnapped and trying to help finish up the uprising um, to free the citizens there. Um, and they're like, that guy's huge. Where did he come from? And everything. And, you know, we have this, you know, little, little, you know, him, you know, a little bit remembering Ginny and everything like that. And, you know, we're flashing back to when it's being explained that when they got the information that Jenny had been captured and like, uh, yes, sir, it seems she caught the eye of a celestial dragon. They took her to the gov on a government ship because the celestial dragon wanted to make her his wife. So, I mean, we've seen in the past with Charlos when we were introduced to Charlos, this, <clears throat> uh, uh, clown that he is. Um, for lack of a word, I don't want to say. Um, and, you know, we saw that he just literally took this woman that was the nurse and was like, you're going to be my bride now and took her. <sighs> also shot her fiance. Um, after shooting her patient right in front of her. Ugh. Um, which is well, kind of going to come back to something in a minute with uh, stuff with Bonnie. But, um... You know, he just, you know, took her and it's like, you're going to be my bride. So I'm assuming this means that some celestial dragon just, like, saw Ginny's wanted poster with the rest of the, you know, revolutionary army, saw her and were like, oh, I want her as my wife. We may eventually end up getting the name of the celestial dragon. Um, it wouldn't be Charlos because I believe he was too young at this point in time. Um... And we really don't know that many other male celestial dragons that would be at the, you know, be um, having this issue at this point in time, or would they be old enough for this? I could be Walt Roswald, but I doubt it. Um, I guess it technically could be Milzegard, but um, because that would be, I believe, before he has his whole, you know, epitome and every, or you know, epiphany and everything like that, because of Otohime. Um, but, I mean, like, there are so many other celestial dragons that we just don't know the names of yet that, you know, this could have been. Um, and, you know, so Kuma is, you know, remembering that, and he's just, you know, he's distraught because of that. And then, you know, he shows up at uh, the kingdom, and, you know, it's just like, you know, he's able to help defeat them. And it's just like, finally, after three years of struggling, um, we couldn't have done it without the Revolutionary Army and everything. And are still getting, you know, cuts back and forth into the flashback where it's just like, you know, the enemy took us by surprise. Please forgive us. You know, they didn't want Jenny to be captured either. They tr probably tried to protect her. Probably several of their men, you know, several of their um, troops died trying to protect Jenny and everything like that. But, you know, so it's, you know, we see the Revolutionary Army flag being flown high. You know, the heroes of the people and everything like that. Now they have their full-on Revolutionary Army flag. 
um, and everything with their dragon on it, probably to represent dragon, and they're going against the celestial dragons and everything. So we see that and everything, and we're still, you know, cutting back and forth um, to where, you know, Kuma is, and Kuma is like, you know, dragon, it's me, you know, I've worn myself out, I have, you know, I have to return by ship and everything. And so, from my understanding is that 14 years ago is where the last chapter ended. And now this is supposed to be about two years later. So the kingdom where they had been fighting has continued to fight and the revolutionary army has continued to support them. During this time frame, Ginny has been with the Celestial Dragons for the past two years. And, um, uh, you know, the revolutionary army has continued to fight. Kuma has continued to fight in her honor and her name and everything like that for what she had been fighting for. Um, and everything, and everything happened with the Goa Kingdom, and, you know, the burning of the Goa Kingdom, and everything like that, um, and such, so we're getting some information there for, like, how this kind of pieces together. Again, thing I want to point back to that, um, I pointed out in my Ivankov video when I talked about Ivankov, um, we don't know exactly when Ivankov ended up in Impel Down, and... We're going to see Ivankov a bit throughout this chapter, so we still don't know exactly when that was that Ivankov ended up in Impel Down. Well, Ivankov and Inazuma, when they ended up in Impel Down. Uh, and again, we're pretty much certain that, like, they probably allowed themselves to be captured. <laughs> um, I wouldn't surprise anybody if that was a plan. Um, so we see, you know... It's, it's explained that around two years have passed since Commander Ginny of the Revolutionary Army was kidnapped uh, to be wed to a celestial dragon. And we see this image, um, and it's, it's supposed to be Ginny on this, you know, boat making her way back to, it's revealed she's on her way back to Sorbet. And everything and we see we hear crying and then we also see the thing of you know we're nearly there bonnie and everything and we get this communication coming in and it is jenny contacting the revolutionaries and they're just like kuma it's jenny she's on the line right now and they're like what and we see kuma and ivankov and dragon there ivankov looking very happy and very surprised dragon looking like dragon I don't know what constitutes dragon smiling. I'm like, okay, did, I think he was happy when Luffy got certain bounties and stuff like that, but there's not much where we see dragon like outright smiling. It's like, he's, he's not, he's not, he's, he's, he's a very sour puss. He's very much a sour puss, um, at times, but he's got a lot on his shoulders, um, and everything. So, um, Ginny is like, Hey, Kumashi, I finally made it back to the surface. And they're just like, Jenny, oh my god. And it's just like, they didn't want me around after I got sick. I was thrown away. <sighs> and she's like, what a stroke of luck. So, you know, even up until the end, she's trying to look on the bright side of things. And such. And Kuma's like, you're sick? And she's like, I wanted to see everyone one last time, but this call will have to be our goodbye. And, and Ivankov's like, wait, and of course, or wait, or what, or whatever. And of course, you know, Ivankov and Jenny have this very good relationship. They basically were siblings while they were slaves and everything like that. Um, and such, and even Dragon is probably very concerned about this because he probably cares about Jenny, um, not just as another member of the Revolutionary Army, but as a friend and everything like that. Um, you know, so we see all of that. And, and Kuma is just like, what are you talking about, Jenny? Where are you? I can be there in an instant. I was afraid I'd never see you again. And even though there's just the sketches, it's like you can still tell that Kuma is crying. And we get another sketch, and I think it's supposed to be Jenny. And she's just like, Kuma, she, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm at death's door. I'm glad you, you care about me, really. But you shouldn't come when I'm like this. And Kuma is just like so distraught about this. And he he's like he's he's figured out where she could be. And he's like running out of the building. Um, and you know, Ginny is just like, Dragon, big bro, Kuma has a big heart. Please take care of him for me. And Kuma's like, get out of the way. There's only one place she'd go now. And Kuma's like running out of the building. And as soon as he's outside, he's like, you know, 
flipping himself away and everything like that. And Jenny is just like, and Kumashi, I just want you to know. And this is where it's either going to be that she's whispering it and it's going to be something that doesn't actually get said out loud um, or so. But it's just like, I love you. Always have. Always will. And, you know, you know, you know, and then the snail hangs up. We cut back to the Sorbet Kingdom and Kuma has arrived and they're just like, Oh my god, Kuma, you're back. And he's like, where's Jenny? She's here, right? And we cut to the church and we see it's either inside the church or just outside the church. I believe they are inside the church for the scenes that we're going to see in a moment. And they're like, she's here, but I'm afraid it happened when she was exposed to natural light. Her face, her entire body, it turned all blue in the sun and her skin hardened like stone. And we see this, it's the snail receiver, and we see a hand that is clearly supposed to be Ginny's hand. And it's covered in, I mean, it'll probably look a lot more detailed. I, my thought is, is that Oda will probably go back through and finish up everything in this chapter before it's put into the Tonko Bon. Um, or they might just leave it the way it is, I'm not sure. We'll find out once the Tonko, Tonko Bon comes out. But we see Ginny's hand, and it's covered in, it just kind of looks like sp like splotches right now and that's what I initially just thought that it was covered in is just like splotches um like how you know when you when you know like when they show stuff for like the plague or different stuff like that it's just the skin is covered in horrible splotches and sores and stuff like that but no it's revealed that her skin is being covered in um what look like gemstones like blue gemstones um and such and they say that it's when she was exposed to the sun and everything and we just see like Kuma is crying and we're seeing these flashbacks where he's, you know, her smiling and happy and, you know, also when she was crying and happy and everything when they were, f you know, when they were full and everything. And, you know, we see that she has the splotches on her, I think that's supposed to be like her foot in a different part of the panel. Um, and, and Kuma is like picking up Bonnie or picking up Ginny. And again, this is showing like this big size comparison between the two of them. And he's like, what could have done this to her? And he's like being very gentle with her. And he and she's like, you know, it's the flashback of Kumashi, let's get married. And it's like, wouldn't that make you happy? And Kuma is just crying so much. And it's, you know, we saw so much over the last chapter. And, you know, the end of the previous chapter and this chapter of just how happy Kuma has been. And it's been, you know, yes, there were tears, but they were tears of joy at times. But also, you know, he's tried to keep up this big happy appearance and everything like that. And, you know, they're not alone in the church. We're seeing that there's other elderly people that probably Kuma and Jenny probably helped take care of and stuff like that. Um, and just other ones that have come across because, like, um, Sorbet Kingdom is kind of free at the moment because they, you know, they got rid of the king. But Kuma is just cr crying so much. And he's just cradling Jenny and holding her to him in the middle of the church. And, you know, this when this is in the anime, it's probably going to be very, very hard to watch. Again, these several chapters here where we're getting Kuma's backstory, Kuma and Jenny's flashback and everything like that, that it's just going to be... It's going to be very hard to watch in the anime when we get to it. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to read in various places as well. <sighs> um, but we'll probably see that in the anime. Um, side note, or different side note, I think it would be a little bit interesting is if the anime ends up making a slight reference to the fact that parts of this chapter were not fully finished being drawn by the time it was, you know, by the time Oda handed it in. And if in the anime, if they make a slight reference to that with, like, how certain stuff is drawn or how certain things are drawn out, that would be kind of interesting. Um, bear in mind, this is also a Kuma that has not gone through any of the body modifications from Vegapunk because we have had no, me no mention thus far of Kuma or the Revolutionary Army, specifically Kuma, interacting with Vegapunk at this point in time. Dragon and Vegapunk might be in slight, you know communication behind the scenes. I know there's some people that are thinking, oh, maybe Vegapunk found a way to funnel money from like his government funding and funnel it to the Revolutionary Army to a degree so that way they would have funds, which is quite possibly what happened. We may not find out about that until later on, um, but that is a possibility. But we see just Kuma here just like cradling Ginny and everything like that. Um, 
And, you know, it's, it's, it's the reason they didn't get married and the reason that they didn't have a child together, biological child together, is, of course, because Kuma didn't want to risk passing on his buccaneer lineage factor to the child and could result again in him and Ginny and their child being taken by the celestial dragons by the world government and turned into slaves. He didn't want to put Jenny through that again and he didn't want to put a child through that. Which is very admirable. Um, but it's also this moment where he's just like he probably really 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 wanted to say yes to Jenny. To, to yes to marrying her and he probably would have been very happy with her. Um, and they probably still would have been able to you know join the revolution and everything like that. But you know, there's still a lot there. And, you know, in the chapter it says, like, she burned up her remaining time exposing herself to the sun so she could cross the ocean and make it home to us. And we see a little baby, and the baby's crying, and they're just like, because she wanted to ensure her baby's safety. And Kuma is just looking at the baby. And considering everything that the celestial dragons have put Kuma through when he was a child with him and his parents and with everything that happened on God Valley and then now with the fact that they were the ones that took Ginny from him and now there is this baby and this baby is kind of the reason that Ginny you know burned up her remaining time and we just see Kuma looking at this baby and I don't think there would have been anyone in the world who would blame Kuma if he looked at the baby, looked at Bonnie, and was just like, I don't want anything to do with this child. Get it away from me. It's part Celestial Dragon. I want nothing to do with it. But that's not Kuma. That is not the Kuma that we have seen over these last several chapters that we have been introduced to. That is not the Kuma that Ginny fell in love with. The Kuma that Ginny knew would take care of her baby. And... Kuma is just like, you can rest now, Jenny. I swear I'll raise her well. And last week I made several comments about um, comparing, you know, Kuma to Winnie the Pooh. And I have a couple of other quotes that I found that are from Winnie the Pooh that I think very much apply to Kuma. And one of them is, um, love is taking a few steps backwards, maybe even more to give way to the happiness of the person you love. And then also, some people care too much. I think it's called love. And another one is, just because an animal is large, it doesn't mean it doesn't want kindness. However big Tigger seems to be, remember that he wants as much kindness as Rue. It never hurts to keep looking for sunshine. The sun still shines even when it's hiding. Disney nerd, I love Winnie the Pooh. Um, and I've loved Winnie the Pooh my whole life. Um, I didn't want to pull out the Winnie the Pooh bear for this. He's in the closet behind me. Um, but I kind of thought all of those quotes somehow still summed up still summed up what is going through Kuma's mind because he's like this baby is a result of my my love my Ginny being taken away from me and her having to put up with celestial dragons for the last two years a specific celestial dragon we don't get the name in this chapter but when we find out about that sometime a lot of people are probably gonna say oh it was Roswell because there's all these connections between Kuma and him and Ginny and Bonnie and everything like that. So it must be Roswald. So so Bonnie has to be Charlos and his sister's, you know, half sibling or something like that. And that's why, you know, blah 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 and you know and you know, we saw Bonnie interact with, you know, Charlos at, you know we saw Bonnie interact with Charlos at um at Saba Odi way back when she saved, you know, Zoro and everything like that. 
you know, that there was that interaction there and everything like that. So, so many people are probably going to draw those conclusions that like, oh, it has to be Roswald and everything like that because of all of these other things, because Oda doesn't do coincidences. Um, so there's a lot that goes with that. And there's going to be a lot of people that probably point out that stuff. So I'll just mention it here. Um, and while I'm at it, um, I do, I did look up because A, in regards to the two things that seem to be going on with uh, Ginny, and that we know unfortunately Bonnie ends up having the same illness later on in the chapter, um, is that A, I already knew that there was a condition where there were people who were allergic to sunlight, and it it is, it's called um, sun allergy or photosens photosensitivity. Um, what it basically is, is just when you're um, exposed to, <coughs> When you're exposed to direct sunlight, it results in kind of like, you know, where you get like hives or, you know, allergy, you know, that type of stuff that would happen if you, you know, if you're allergic to something else, it basically what happens with the sunlight. And there are a lot of people who end up having to, you know, stay inside for a good chunk of their lives or have a huge amounts of, you know, having to be in the shade and stuff like that and to be able to deal with it. I do believe that there are... Um, skincare regimes that you can do to help with it, that there are uh, other medications and stuff like that that you can uh, take to help with it as well. Um, uh, to help with, you know, minimizing the symptoms or preventing them to a degree, I'm sure there are. Um, so, you know, the skin unfortunately can still be affected even if it's covered by, you know, clothes or stuff like that. So this is not, it's not a very um, prominent um, allergy, but I do know that it does exist because I've heard about it before. Um, and I am going to point this out. Someone else probably pointed it out as well, or will point it out. It's the fact that it's Ginny is allergic to the sun. For the last 30 some years of her life, we have seen no indication of this because we've seen her outside and in the sun and interacting with Kuma and other people outside and everything like that. So this is a disease that just kind of developed while she was at Marie Joie. Um, even though she had already spent like a good chunk of her life as a child at Marie Joie and she didn't seem to have this issue. So she's had it now. And some people will make a comparison to maybe it's like cancer and it's, you know, it showed up now. Um, it's just something else that developed. It's just there now that just happened and everything. And it got passed to Bonnie, unfortunately. Um, and maybe that's, you know, that connection there is probably going to draw into to Vegapunk as well later on for Bonnie and Kuma. Um, but so there's a lot there with that. The other side of it is that it's like she's allergic to the sun. And what has Kuma been putting his faith in for the majority of his life? Sun God Nika. And the fact that now this appears to be a type of like a cursed by the sun type of a thing on his, on his love and then on his daughter. Um, then does that mean that, that we know that later on we see him still have this faith in Nika. So I don't think that makes his faith in Nika waver. Um, I think Kuma is also smart enough and has been around enough people to understand the fact that like sometimes diseases just develop. They just happen and you can try to fight them as much as you want, but if you don't have the right treatment, then you can't do anything about it. Um, you can just, you know, you can't control what your body is going to do, but you can control your outlook on life. Um, the other side of that is that it also says that her skin seems to be having like jewels or stuff like that. Um, they end up being described as like sapphires later on. There is a disease. It's called uh, uh, Glorinderma. I probably mispronounced it. Don't look at pictures of it. I don't. Just don't. It's gross. Um, it, it, it literally translates to hard skin. And it is a, a family of diseases, but it basically results in the skin developing textures and stuff like that where it looks like it is like made of stone or made of um, 
very, very hard material or stuff like that. Um, it can develop very rapidly um, and it is not a fun thing to deal with. I didn't look up that much more about it because it just looked really, really disturbing and I didn't want to look at any more pictures of it um, or risk looking at any more pictures of it because it just looks very sad and not fun to deal with and whoever has this has my sympathy. Um, but I wanted to point those out. So in the chapter, back to the chapter, I got a tangent there, sorry couple of tangents but in the chapter we see it where we see him where we see kuma making the promise that he will look over that he will watch after bonnie um and we have this moment where you know he's in the church he's on the on the ground between the pews we see the cross up on the wall and in the middle of the cross we have one big circle and then it's eight smaller circles around it so like uh, the sun and the planets um, probably is a good comparison there. Um, you know, this might be a Nika church that, you know, Kuma's father built, that Clap built, you know, years and years ago, and then Kuma has kept it, you know, taken care of and everything like that <sighs> over the last, you know, 20 some years and everything. And, you know, Kuma is making this promise, and I'm sure that when this is animated, it's just going to look gorgeous and. You know, we're going to get these beautiful close-ups of other things around the church, of the pews and of the light streaming through into the church um, as Kuma's making this promise to Ginny and everything like that. And it might be a bit of a callback to um, uh, one of my favorite scenes in any Disney movie in the God Help the Outcasts from uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, the song that Esmeralda sings while she's walking through Notre Dame. And, you know, the ending of that song is her standing in the, standing in the big room while the light streams in from the famous rose window, um, and is all around her and everything. And, you know, that is a very good, adept answer there of, uh, comparing Esmeralda to, um, the Revolutionary Army and everything like that. Um, there is a comparison that could be made there that might get turned into a video. We'll see there. Um, once we get, you know, more stuff about Ginny and everything like that. Um, or once we get to maybe that in the anime and stuff like that. There's a comparison that can be made there. But, like, that that moment there that is just one of the most beautifully animated scenes in any Disney movie. is just, like, all of the, all the light flowing through the rose window and everything like that all around Esmeralda. Um, but we cut to her. We see that uh, Kuma has buried Ginny. We also see, like, four other graves in the back. Probably one of them is probably stuff for his parents and then there's probably stuff there possibly for Ginny's parents and then there's also just like other members of their community that have passed away probably um over the years and we cut back to the church where we have all the old people yelling at Kuma about no you're doing it wrong you know it's just like you're tilting the bottle too high Bonnie <laughs> you know Bonnie still looks uncomfortable I'll you know I'll show you how to do this you know it's just like is, you know, Kuma is just like, he's like so big and Ginny and Bonnie is just like, just like this little tiny thing in his hand, you know, comparison there, um, which is so adorable and he's just trying to be so gentle and everything and he's, you know, got this giant bottle and he's just trying to very carefully feed her and everything like that and they're just like, oh my god, she's so cute and it was like, and if you're going to be sleeping next to her, make sure her cot is is like an iron cage. We can't have you smushing her in your sleep with that massive body and everything like that. That comes back. Um, so, we, you know, we have it that Kuma is just like, he's probably been around some kids and stuff like that, but probably not a huge amount. Um, and Kuma is not... Kuma is very much taking the whole thing of like, the sins of the parents are not the sins of the child, regardless of who Ginny... of who... Bonnie's of who Bonnie's biological father may be, whatever horrible celestial dragon that may be. Kuma is not thinking about that. Kuma is looking at this child, and all he is seeing is the child of the woman he loves, of the child of Ginny, and the child that could have possibly been their child had he actually said yes to marrying her. And he is just like, I, I am going to take care of this child, and I am going to give this baby all of the love that it deserves, and I am going to give her just everything that I can. I'm going to make this world free for her so she doesn't have to worry. And he's just like, you know, you're quite the heavy drinker, Bonnie-chan, and you know, just like, you'll be just as much of a glutton as Jenny. 
and everything like that. So we're just, you know, we're getting all of this. And Kuma, he's he's taking it in stride. And he's just like, I'm just going to do everything I can to take care of this little girl. Um, and everything. And, you know, we cut, you know, it's a couple years later, a little while later. And we just see, you know, little Bonnie just like going, Daddy! And then Kuma just has tears streaming down his face with as happy as he is to see her. Um, and, the, and the fact that she called him daddy and everything like that. So that's just adorable there. Um, that whole thing of like, you know, like when the, when the kid finally says mommy or daddy and you're just like, oh my God, oh my God. You know, it's like, the baby got my name right. I'm good. Um, um, so there's that. And then we see also just like, you know, Ginny or Bonnie being just like completely and utterly adored by all of the other people on the island, on, on the Sorbet Kingdom and everything like that, that are like all the old people that are in the Sorbet Kingdom. Um, just like adoring Bonnie and taking good care of her and treating her just like a little princess and everything. And Kuma is just, he's just like so overcome with joy um, about it and everything like that. And, you know, just seeing how, you know, she does have, you know, the, the gluttonous appetite just like Ginny did and everything like that. And Kuma just takes such good care of her. And, you know, Kuma is still a member of the Revolutionary Army at this point in time. He still keeps going and helping with fighting and everything like that. And the, the elderly people on the island in Sorbet, like, take care of Ginny while he's... Or take care of Bonnie um, while he's gone and everything like that. And, you know, and then he'll come back to the island and see her again. And, you know, then he'll go off and do more stuff. And then he'll come back again and everything like that. Um, so we see him going back and forth. We see, you know, is this, you know, he's giving her a bath and we see other stuff where he's just like off trying to, you know, help another kingdom and everything like that. And we get another panel that's him sleeping on his giant freaking bed and then Bonnie in like this cage. And it's not, it's, it's not a cage designed to keep her trapped. It is a cage that is designed simply as the, you know, as the elderly said, it's a, it's an iron cage. So that way if Kuma does happen to roll over in the middle of the night, he's not going to squish Bonnie. Um, there are, um, baby beds that you can buy that are similar to this. So you can like attach to like the, like the main bed, the parents bed. And then there's like a cover that you can put over it. So that way, um, if you do happen to roll over in the middle of the night, you're not going to roll onto the baby because there's a barrier there preventing it. Um, so those exist. I've seen them. Um, they're not necessarily an iron cage, but that's kind of what we have at the moment. Um, we cut to where we see a picture of, um, Kuma and Sabo. So this is then, uh, lining up for when Sabo, <laughs> this is lining up, sorry for the coughing. Uh, this is when Sabo is, you know, a member of the Revolutionary Army and he's training and everything like that, which I think was something we really only saw in the anime in like the couple of episodes of like story of Sabo or whatever. Um, where they were filling in the gaps with, like, Sabo's life alongside what was going on with, like, Luffy and Ace at that point in time. Um, with Luffy and Ace and Goa and everything like that, and then Sabo with the Revolutionaries. Um, so we're getting some, you know, cut-ins with that to, like, show that, um, comparison there. Because, of course, Sabo, you know, had nothing but adoration and, you know, everything like that for Kuma and everything, um when they were at Marie's while trying to save him and everything. So there's connections there. And he's just like, Kuma has always been like the nicest person I've ever met and everything like that, you know, with the biggest heart, which given what we're showing here, Kuma has, Kuma has a heart that is far too big and far too good for this world. Um, and everything. And then we're cutting to where we have it that, you know, that we're at the church again and we're just going, Kuma, Kuma, what in the world are you doing? You've boarded up all the church's windows. And we see the two that were the two kids that we met at the end, like two chapters ago or whatever, that were the two that, you know, the two that, you know, Kuma healed. Um, and, you know, the one that's like the fishmonger, the two that end up being on Bonnie's crew, um, that we know end up being on Bonnie's crew much later on. And they're like, oh my God, what are you, why, why did you board up all the windows and everything like that? And Kuma's just like closed the door and they're like, what's wrong? And they're like, take a look here below her, below her eye. And we see that there's this little jewel, this little blue stone, um, that has appeared and Bonnie is just kind of like, huh, what's wrong? And they're just like, oh my God, is that a blue stone? And there isn't that, isn't that looks just like what happened with Ginny. And, you know, at the end and everything like that. And they're just, like, very concerned instantly because, like, you know, Ginny was their friend. And this is, you know, Jenny's daughter. And she seems to be having this same issue. 
And they're like, oh my god, what's going on? And they're just like, we're not. I was like, we'll call the doctor. And, you know, it's like, they're just like, they're like going right at it. It's like, we're getting the doctor in here as fast as we can. And Kim is just like, thank you. And, you know, we get these doctors showing up and they're just like, hmm, it's caused by sunlight. Are you sure? Uh, why don't we try taking her outside? And it's cool. It's just like, you're in, you're in, in <laughs> are you insane? It's like, the sun causes this. I'm not taking her in the sun. And then we get a woman doctor who's just like, hmm, doesn't seem to be am uh, white lead poisoning. I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with this condition. So the white lead, the amber lead syndrome, that's the callback to everything that happened with Law and Flevins and everything like that with his backstory. Um, so that's getting called back to there. Um, and we, you know, we have Kuma going to talk with Ivankov and Dragon. So this is supposed to be, I think Bonnie's supposed to be about two, maybe two and a half-ish during this little bit. Um, maybe three, I'm not sure. Um, she's not very old, but Ivankov is still here. So um, Bonnie was born, because uh, Ginny was captured 14 years ago. It's 12 years. Bonnie's supposed to be about 12 years old canonically. So everyone that was like, oh, she's a child and blah, 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 blah. She's, you know, been, you know, that's why everybody keeps calling her a child and everything like that. That's why Vegapunk and Saturn and, and all this other stuff and, you know, you know, Ku, you know, Kizaru keep calling her a kid and everything like that. Because she's the kid. And she's like, okay, fine. She's not a clone. She's not a clone. Can we stop with the Bonnie is a clone stuff now? Because she's not a clone. She's just, she's just 12. And she's been put through a lot in her life already. Um, and she uses her devil fruit to age herself up. Fine. We're got it. We're good. Got it? Good. Done. Um, not everyone's a clone. <sighs> um, she's not amnesia. She's not Ginny with amnesia. The Kuma renamed or whatever. No. Um, so we have uh, Kuma talking to Dragon Ivankov. So Ivankov is not in, in Pell Down yet. And they're just like, you're quitting the Revolutionary Army. And he's like, and Kuma's, and uh, Ivankov's like, um, what, Bonnie has contracted the same disease her mother had? And Kuma's like, yes. And he's just like, I don't know if it's the right thing to do, but I have to stay by her side. And we get this moment from Dragon, and Dragon's like, I understand. It's important to live without regrets. <sighs> we can use our contacts to reach out to doctors all over the world for her. And Kuma's like, I owe you, Dragon. And I think that thing about, you know, living with, you know, you know, it's important to live without regrets. That either means Dragon does somewhat regret giving up Luffy and not raising Luffy, which might be a call there, or he's not regretting the fact that he left Luffy with Garp or just on Fusha, in Fusha Village and has, you know, he's like, I'm doing what I need to do to make the world better for my son, even if that means I don't actually have to be around my son, even if I'm not actually with my son. So there's probably some, you know, thoughts there um, on that from Dragon. Um, so, you know, it's like, we're just like, you know, um, uh, you know, they're just like, you know, we'll see what we can do, find a, you know, find a good doctor that can help explain what's going on with Ginny and everything like that, or what's going on with Bonnie and everything. Um, and then we cut to, what, seven years ago in the Sorbet Kingdom when Bonnie was five. Um, and they're just like, run away, it's the vampire, it's gonna eat us, and blah, 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 and they're just like running away, and Ginny's standing there, you know, flipping them off and everything. Um, stay out, you twerps. Um, and they're just like, you know, they're teasing her and blowing and, you know, sticking their tongues out at her and everything like that. And they're just like, I dare you to take a step out where you, out of this, out the here, you ugly vampire. And I was like, one of the stupid kids is holding a cross at Bonnie. And they're just like, eat, you know, eat this. You probably, you know, the Holy Cross is probably your weakness. And it's just like, look at it shine. And then she just like jump kicks him. Which is just funny because it's just like... We're in a church, you dummy, is literally what she's like. And she's just like, scary. I'm just like, I'll show you who's boss. I'm coming after you. And she, you know, and they're just like running away. And it's just like, you idiot. She's in a church and she's a, and she's not a vampire. She's just in a church. Your cross is not going to do anything against her. So it's just like, <laughs> idiot kids. Um. And we have Kuma, you know, grabbing Bonnie and pulling her back in. And she's like, please, you can't go outside. You know, it's like even standing near the doorway can give you 
you know, the ouchies. And she's like, I know you're such a worry wart, dad. I was just kidding. And she's just like, and he's just like, please don't even joke about it. And she's like, okay, I hate when you get all sad and worried anyway. And again, we're getting this huge size comparison between Kuma and Bonnie. Um, and Bonnie has like kind of the, the dirty clothes and stuff like that, you know, not very well kept together clothes. Kuma is back in his like a uh, pastor outfit and everything like that. And he's just like, oh, you're such a good kid. And he's like, oh, you're, she's like, stop being a crybaby daddy. Let go. <laughs> um, and she's like, those jerks, they made fun of my face stones again. And she's just like, are they really that weird? It's not like I can help them. I didn't ask to get sick. So again, this is kind of like calling back to where there's like lots of kids that, you know, have different type of illnesses, kids that are different, kids that have physical illnesses or mental illnesses um, or both. Um, some very severe, some not. It just depends on where they land on the spectrum and everything like that. And it's very... You know, there's lots of kids that, you know, have to put up with a lot of stuff, you know, just because of that already, regardless of, you know, their own personality um, and such. And, you know, Bonnie is just like, I don't know why they're so mean about it. There's no reason to be mean about it. I can't control it. I didn't choose to have this. And Kuma is probably taking a page out of Avonkov's um, book at this point in time. It's just like, you mean your jewels? And she's like, huh? And he's just like, yeah, they're just jewel. They're just jealous because uh, you've got such pretty jewelry. And she's just like, oh, you think? And she's just like, and he's like, you betcha, I love them. And so it's just like, it, it, you know, jewelry, Bonnie, Bonnie, jewelry. I tried to see if I could find any... Um, like jewelry stick on stuff that I could like put a couple of them under my eye or stuff like that as a reference you know to what Bonnie has but I couldn't find any and my mom didn't have any so I was just like okay well that's not happening um so we have that and, you know Kuma's just trying to cheer Bonnie up and everything like that so um Kuma is being very good with that and it is quite obvious because when we get to the next page that like he has boarded up all of the windows in the church which they've probably been boarded up very much for the last you know five years or so um ever since the first little jewels appeared those are all boarded up probably most of the doors are kept closed um they may still have it where they have like services here and where you know the people show up and kuma will you know reject their pain and everything like that and get a couple more versions of you know the nothing happened thing with kuma um where he'll take their pain into himself and stuff like that but um it also looks like they've turned a bunch of the church into like this big playroom for Bonnie, um, which I think is a very sweet thing because I'm probably, sh I'm pretty sure that like the people that, you know, like the elderly people that were helping him take care of her and that show up a lot still probably um, keep, you know, that maybe some of them made some of these toys for Bonnie. Maybe some of the stuff was given to them by Dragon and Ivankov or by other members of the Revolutionary Army that were like, hey, you know, I found this toy while I was out, you know, do you want to take it home and give it to Bonnie and everything like that? And I think that makes sense. We also see a little bear in the panel and the bear has a similar hat to Kuma or it might actually be just Kuma's hat on the bear because Kuma's not wearing a hat right now. Um, he's got his little ears on, but he doesn't have his hat. Um, so uh, there's, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, Kuma has made it, has done what he can to try to have this nice big inside play area for Bonnie, which I love. And he's just like, hey, Bonnie, if you were to, if you were to go on a trip, where would you like to go for when you're better, I mean? And she's like, oh, I know. I want to, I've heard about the legendary Sky Islands. And she's like showing him this book of like, you know, I've heard about the Sky Islands. And he's like, wait, there are? And they're like, yeah, it's like I read about them in this book. And they're like so close to the sun. So maybe we'll see Nika up there. You'd love that, dad. And, you know, Kuma starts doing the Nika dance and everything. So that's just adorable with, you know, the drum beat liberation, um, you know, noise and everything like that. So Bonnie grows up knowing about Nika. And that may have been one of the reasons why when she saw Luffy again, she may have made the comment about, you know, hey, why do you look so weird in your wanted poster and everything like that? And now there's going to be this moment where it would be very interesting because Bonnie wasn't really around 
Luffy when he was fighting against Kizaru. Um, and Luffy is currently kind of out cold on the floor while Bonnie's being held up by Saturn. Um, and I, you know, it's going to be very interesting is like if Luffy wakes up again and he gets the drum beats going again, if Bonnie hears that and remembers it as, you know, the, the drum beats of liberation, the noise that her father would make. The, the rhythm that her father would make when he was talking about Nika. And maybe that'll make something click in Bonnie and she will be able to say, Luffy has this drumbeat of liberation. Luffy has this power. Luffy is Nika. That would be an amazing connection for Bonnie to be able to be the one to figure that out and then tell that to Luffy and the others um, after they manage to escape. Um, that would be very, very interesting way of doing that. I would love it if they did that because like she knows about Nika. She's grown up with these stories from her father about Nika and everything with him being the sun god and the god of liberation and everything like that and all of that. So that would be a very interesting comparison there for like Bonnie to be the one that f f explained this to Luffy. And then Luffy can finally get the whole realization of, oh, I guess I am kind of a zone. Okay, that's weird. I guess I lied to Momo. Um... <laughs> <laughs> way back in that trash pit. Um, it's like, you didn't lie, you just didn't know the whole truth. Um, so, you know, Kuma is just like, you know, it sounds like a grand adventure. We can go there um, for a big celebration on your 20th birthday. Where would you like to go for your 19th? And she's like, Fishman Island. And like, they're both dancing and everything like that, um, which is just adorable. So, you know, it's like she wants to go all the way up to the Sky Islands and she wants to go to Fishman Island. Now, admittedly, to get through to the New World... Bonnie would have had to have gone through Fishman Island. So it's a, assumed that Bonnie has at least gone through Fishman Island. Whether or not Bonnie has managed to make it to a Sky Island is a little bit left up for debate. Um, and now we have it that this doctor has actually managed to show up and he's actually able to diagnose Bonnie. And he's like, okay, after examining your daughter, I've concluded that she suffers from Sapphire Scale. Um, I'm afraid it's incurable. And Kuma's like, a what do you know? I'm sorry to ask, but could you please speak a little, a, a bit quieter type of a thing? And he's like, uh, sure. He's just like, um, these days I've almost never seen it. These, those stones grow exponentially, uh, when bathed in any form of natural light, uh, like the sun or the moon. And even if the, even if you completely prevent any exposure, I'm afraid it's only a matter of time before the disease catches up with you. And Kim was like, or he's like, forgive me for being blunt, um, but your daughter has another five years at best. It'll be a miracle if she reaches her 10th birthday. He's like, I'm afraid it's simply terminal. It goes by our current, going by our current scientific understanding of it. And Kuma is just like, this, the, the, you know, it's the horrible realization of like, if you get it, you know, if you're a parent and you're told that your child has some form of cancer or some form of other disease that is terminal that like you know with what our medical knowledge can do now we can do stuff to help prevent this and slow it down but it may not go away um so there's a lot there and kim is just like it'll be over by her 10th birthday and he's just like it isn't fair she's already growing into such a strong woman is there really no cure and he goes back inside the church and Bonnie is just like, boo! And he's just like, uh, Bonnie, I thought you were asleep. And she's like, I heard all of it. You said it'll be over by my 10th birthday, right? And it's just like, you know, Bonnie is not... <laughs> either Bonnie is purposely not catching on, as in like she fully understands what it, what it meant, but she doesn't want to have her father realize that she's figured it out. Or she doesn't actually understand it. Um, that she actually thinks it just means that when she's 10, she'll be cured. And he's just like, you're 10th. I have no idea what you're talking about. And she's like, I heard you say it. Are you, hey, are you crying? Is it something I said? He's like, yes. He said when you're 10, um, it's about your illness, Bonnie. That stupid doctor, he told me that your condition is going to continue as it is until you're 10. She's like, huh? And he's like, it's just such a appalling amount of time. I couldn't help but get down about it. 
And he's like, or she's like, so that means that I'll be all better when I'm 10, right? So we can go on all those trips. Isn't that right, Daddy? And he's like, oh no, what have I done? And again, it's either Bonnie understands exactly what is going on. She understands exactly that it's like, no, when you're 10, that means that you're going to die. Or she's just like, no, I'm going to ignore that. And I'm going to be the happy version. So that way I can at least try to keep my dad happy. And so, you know, it's like, it's again, it's this moment where it's just like, she can either be very, very depressed and sad about everything that's going on and just, you know, give up. Or she can continue to just smile and fight it and be happy as long as possible. Which, again, when you're faced with, you know, horrible diseases and other things like that, sometimes the most you can do is just try to have a positive outlook. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to change the results of what's going to happen, but you can at least make it that you're not wallowing in self-pity all of the time. Doesn't mean you don't have the right to wallow in self-pity at times if you have those types of diseases, but it means that you don't have to do that all of the time. And he's like, um, of course, by the time you've turned 10, you'll be cured. And she's like, yippee. And he's like, what am I going to do? Um, and then we cut to the last page of the chapter or the, the last part of the chapter. And it's just like a familiar nightmare would soon descend on the kingdom of Sorbet only one year later. So now Bonnie's six. And they're just, and we see all the old people showing up and are just like, you've got to save us. King Bercori has, Bercori has returned and he's just as monstrous as ever. And it's just like, it's just like 16 years ago. He still wants to cut loose the country's dead weight. He's going to burn the people in their homes. Um, and it says break next week. So we do have a break next week. Um. And, you know, it's just like the little comment of like the never ending tragedy continues to unfold. And, you know, Kuma is just like, oh, no. And, you know, we see the, the older people, the elderly people coming in and like some of them have like like blood, like they've been hit with rocks or stuff like that. And they're bleeding and they're crying and everything like that. And, of course, Kuma is still kind of this country's defender. Um, you know, with him and the revolutionaries, they were able to get rid of, you know, Bercori, you know, Bercori 16 years ago. And now he's back. Now, admittedly, in last chapter, they did not state that Bercori was dead. They just said that he managed to escape. And now he's returned, and he's just as horrible as ever, as they stated. Um, so we have those. Um, that's, that's where the chapter ends. Probably what's going to happen is uh, Kuma is going to go and find his way to... Um, dealing with Bakori, he'd probably be strong enough to take on Bakori himself, but it depends on what type of forces are around. Um, and, you know, we still have about six years to go before we're caught up to the current timeline, and we still have to have it that, you know, Kuma and Bonnie end up interacting with uh, Vegapunk and setting up that relationship there, where Bonnie develops a relationship with Vegapunk and gets to know Sentamaru, and has some connection with Kizaru and everything like that from like the Vegapunk bunch thing and everything. And where Kuma will, you know, hand himself over to become an experiment for, um, you know, Vegapunk for the world government and eventually for the Pacifista experiment and everything like that. Where, you know, Kuma allows Vegapunk to study him and everything like that and everything. That'll probably be, be um, stuff that we're getting into in the next chapter. Um, I did want to make a comment about the, um, I know there's so many people that are like, you know, like, well, what about the Dowager Queen Connie stuff with like Bonnie being able to, you know, where is she going to get her devil fruit? It is quite possible that Bonnie will, um, get her devil fruit, um, while she's at Vegapunk's lab or some other moment where she'll get the devil fruit because she doesn't have it yet. Um, and... You know, Vegapunk, if there's anyone that would come be able to come up with a cure for the Sapphire Scales, it would be Vegapunk. Um, or at the very least, a stopgap measure. Um, because even if Bonnie was able to physically age her body up and down, that doesn't necessarily mean that she would be able to just instantly heal her disease and just make the Sapphire Scales go away. And throughout the course of the series that we've seen Bonnie, we've seen her outside a lot. Um, we saw her outside at Saba Odi when she saved Zoro. We saw her um, outside uh, when Marine Ford was going on. Um, she was outside for other points in time um, when she had to deal with um, uh, 
Akainu and everything after she was captured by Blackbeard. Uh, after the time skip, we've seen her outside several times. Um, and even while they were running around on, um, you know, Egghead Island, she was outside to a degree. So we've seen Bonnie outside multiple times and we haven't seen anything that indicates that she still has the sapphire scales going on. And she wears skimpy enough outfits that, you know, she, you know, if she had them, we would see them. So I'm assuming that Vegapunk probably found a cure for Bonnie. Um, and was able to fix her. Um, by a side note, I would think, well, I don't know, would Law, I mean, would Law's op op no me be able to cure Bonnie? I mean, by a technicality, I would think yes, but I don't know, since that's more of like in a genetic thing as opposed to like, you know, the disease where like the amber lead would get passed down, I don't know if Law would be able to fix Bonnie, you know, with the op op no me and, you know, fix the sapphire scales. I don't know if that would happen. That's a possibility, but I'm not sure. Um, so there's that. Um, I did want to point out the, you know, the Dowager Queen Connie thing. So um, depending on when Bonnie got her devil fruit, she could have aged herself up to an old grandma and then pretended to be Kuma's mother. Um, depending on stuff, you know, because Kuma still has to become, like, the king of Sorbet, which he's not yet, so we'll see what happens there. Um, so that's what I have. I thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you have a nice rest of your day. Bye!